Welcome back to another Mindful Review. I'm your host as always, Jay Nichol. And today we're going to be looking at the Stone Glacier Terminus and the Seek Outside Goshawk. And this is my attempt at an ultralight hunting backpack review. So if you remember a while back, I did a pretty big expedition grade hunting pack review. And a lot of people were asking for the Seek Pack and a lot of people asking for the Terminus Pack. And my argument at the time was that the average weight of the packs I was looking at was six pounds plus. Both these packs come in around the four pound mark. So I, I felt they were in a different category because they're not as feature rich as some of those other packs. So I didn't feel a head to head comparison was fair. And I thought that both of these packs actually went about solving the same issue in very unique ways. That's one of the things I really look for when I'm doing one of these comparative reviews. I wanna do apples to apples and oranges to oranges, but I also want there to be some differences in the way the products approach solving the problem so that by putting them side to side, we can see kind of what makes each pack stand out and why one pack might be a little bit more suitable for you than another based on your age, weight, body type, hunting preferences, a variety of issues. Before we dig into the review, I got some really big news I wanna share. As some of you may remember, when I did my big tent review, I raffled off all the tents afterwards. Ever since I started The Mindful Hunter, I've been trying to find a way to monetize the brand, primarily so that I can just afford to do all the reviews that I actually wanna do. And when I came up with the idea of raffling off gear after I was done reviewing it, it really opened up a world of opportunities because now I could look at any gear that I wanted to and I wouldn't have to worry about brand relationships, sacrificing my integrity. Um, there's only a limited amount of money I can keep sinking into Mindful Hunter and the Mindful Reviews. And everybody seemed to be super into the raffle. Sold out crazy fast. So since then, I've been working on this side project and it's basically the Mindful Reviews community. So here's how things are gonna work going forward. The day this video launches, I am also launching the Mindful Reviews community. So this is gonna be a membership-based community. You're gonna pay a small monthly fee, and when you belong to the community, you will get access to the raffles. So from now on, for instance, I'm raffling these two packs off once this review is done. If you wanna participate in that raffle, you have to belong to the Mindful Reviews community. Now, in addition, you will participate in product selection, category selection. You will participate in the reviews themselves. I'll be sending stuff out to some members to get their feedback. You'll be choosing the elements of different products that you want me to look at. There's going to be lots of forums. I'll put the link to Mindful Reviews here. I don't want this video to be solely focused on Mindful Reviews, but I want you to know that moving forward, I'm putting everything into that community. So all my reviews will still always be free. Everything will go up on YouTube. If you just want to view my content and you don't want to participate in the creation of it and you don't want to participate in the raffles, no problem. You will never have to worry about paid access to my content. It will always be free. However, for those people that want a little more engagement and want to participate in the review process and want to participate in the raffles, it's going to start at five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year. So 16% discount if you buy a year. And right now, if you buy a lifetime membership, it's only 250 bucks. And in addition to all the things I've already mentioned, I will be doing a giveaway every three months. The first giveaway is a Yeti 48 hard side roadie cooler valued at 450 bucks US. Every three months, everyone who is a lifetime member for the lifetime of their membership will get put in a pool. I'll pull out a winner and I'll have tons of like premium hunting gear. Like I want those prizes to be in the neighborhood of like 500 to a thousand dollars, like really big prizes every three months. If you go to mindful-reviews.com, all of this will be explained in way more detail. And if you have any questions, as always, j at mindfulhunter.com or hit me up on Instagram, mindful underscore hunter. Okay, like I said, I don't want this whole video to be focused on mindful reviews. I know most of you just came here for the backpack review content. All right, in the first five minutes of the recording of this video, this cat 
has interrupted me like eight times trying to get in here. So we're gonna shoot the video with the cat. If you see a cat walking around in the background, so be it. Everybody, this is Percy. Percy, this is everybody. He's super chill. Okay, go do whatever you wanna do, man. All right, back to the content. So as I was saying, I normally try and do this stuff completely off the cuff because I find it a little more natural and authentic, but these things get so intense and so in depth that I gotta have the laptop open to kind of keep me on track. So let's talk a little bit of high level stuff. I'm gonna go through this quickly because I do it at the beginning of all my videos, but in case there's any newcomers, I really think this is important content. I wanna make a note about tribalism and the psychological effects of marketing. People like to belong. It's one of the major elements of marketing and how you entice people to purchase your product by making them feel like they're part of an in-group. That's most of the reason why you feel like you associate with the brands that you do. I just want you to be aware of that as we move forward. I am not looking to say a bunch of negative stuff about one of your favorite brands, but ask yourself, if I do give something a harsh criticism and it upsets you, is it upset you because of the actual criticism I have, or is it upsetting you because of some emotional attachment you have to that brand and you feel like I'm attacking something that you belong to? Again, just build a little self-awareness in that regard because as you get deeper into like product evaluation, you need to try and remain as objective as possible. So I try really hard not to align myself too deeply with any brands on a psychological or emotional level. It's, they're just products and I'm gonna do my best to remain as objective as possible. And I think you'll get the most out of this review if you approach it in the same fashion. Both of these bags are a premium choice and are gonna serve you well. I feel very confident right out of the gate recommending both these bags. They're, the construction quality is very high, the customer support is fantastic, the prices are reasonable. We're here to have a conversation about the one to 2% differences, the little, interesting nuances of one pack compared to another pack that that might make one of these packs better for you than another pack or might make you realize neither of these packs is appropriate for what you're looking for but just remember if you've bought one of these and i end up saying i kind of like the other one a little bit better don't regret your purchase you've made a good purchase both of these are good bags they're just they just solve problems in different ways another quick note pack preference is highly personally dependent your body is going to be different from my body. It's going to be different from somebody else's body. So at the end of the day, no matter how in-depth I go with all this material, nothing is going to replace actually trying on one of these bags. Now, I live in Canada, so getting to try these on before buying them is not a realistic option. So that's part of the reason why I started doing these series of videos. But just keep that in the back of your mind. Also, there's no perfect pack for every situation. And you're really gonna see that shine through in this particular line of packs. Because they have strived to be extremely ultra lightweight, there have been compromises made uh, across the design of the pack. There has to be, you can't have a perfect pack. So just remember that as we dive into specialist products, they're gonna be really, really good at some things and not so great at others. And finally, this is gonna be a long video, okay? I'm gonna do my best to keep it concise and to focus on the material that matters, but I looked at 24 different elements of these packs. I looked at price, weight honesty, capacity per weight, purchase experience, American bonus, Canadian bonus, lids, compression system, fitting, construction, lumbar pad, load lifter angle, meat shelf, day pack mode, accessories, training, warranty, durability, water resistance, functional volume, hardware, 40 pound comfort and stability, 80 pound comfort and stability, and 120 pound comfort and stability. So just recognize I've covered an insane amount of material and it's gonna take me a while to get through it all. Also, while there will be a winner based on the point system that I've applied, I am gonna make some caveats at the end and try and talk about under different situations, which of these packs I would purchase based on different hunting preferences and different body types. Now, as far as the scoring system goes, there was two packs. So as I said, I looked at 24 different elements and on each one of those elements, one pack got one point for first place 
and the other pack would get two points for second place. And then at the end of the day, whichever pack had the lowest score came in first place overall. But like I say, I'm gonna add some, some context to that as we walk through the ranking of, of, of overall and then as well on each of the individual elements. Okay, first thing we need to get into is fabric construction. The majority of packs built over the last, you know, modern era have all been made out of cordura, which is like a nylon weaved material. Extremely strong, relatively lightweight, moderately water resistant if treated properly. Overall, a fantastic, versatile material. These two packs are not made out of cordura. They are made out of a fabric called Ultra. Now, if you've heard of fabrics like Dyneema or Spectra, these are, are similar materials. They're just trademarked and branded differently. So these are Ultra High Molecular Weight Polyethylene or UHMWPE is what you can refer to most of these products as. Just calling them Ultra works. Now, I was gonna dive into a super complicated explanation of what Ultra is, and I, I think it's gonna to take too long and I don't think it's gonna be beneficial. So for the sake of our argument, I want you to think of it like this. So previously, you had nylon strands, okay, that were weaved together in order to create a fabric. Now, the thicker those nylon strands were, the greater the strength of the material. So you'll hear about 500D Cordura, 1000D Cordura. That D stands for denier. Now, one denier is the diameter or thickness of one strand of silk. So if you have a 500D Cordura, that means that every individual strand of nylon in that Cordura weave is the diameter of 500 threads of silk. And that measurement system is gonna carry over into this new material. But essentially, Ultra is made out of these long polyethylene chains that I believe they're actually made in, in liquid, like they inject polyethylene into liquid and it forms these long strands. The strands of polyethylene are incredibly strong. Um, and this is another note I wanna make. You will hear a variety of figures about like, Ultra is this much stronger than Cordura or Ultra 400 is this much stronger than Ultra 200. And I've done a lot of research and there's a lot of varying opinions. Plus, you also have a lot of trademarked materials. For instance, Seek Outside uses Ultra 400 while Storm Glacier uses a proprietary SG UHMWPE material that they say is roughly equivalent to Ultra 400. But what I don't wanna do is get carried away and tell you that Ultra is like this be all, end all perfect fabric. It's not. It's a little bit harder to sew. It has some water resistant characteristics, but as you're gonna find out in this video, it's not nearly as water resistant as some people would like to market it as. Also, what I'm gonna get into now, when they go to weave that polyethylene together, one of the benefits of polyethylene is its strength one of the drawbacks, I guess, is its lack of friction. So when you weave these polyethylene strands together, they're so slippery, for lack of a better word, on a molecular level, that just the weave alone isn't enough to keep them together. So you have to laminate them between diff diff different types of fabric. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. The two elements that really contribute to the quality of an ultra fabric is the denier of the polyethylene used in the weave and then the materials used to laminate that weave. And everybody is, is kind of making unique choices. I don't think the evolution of Ultra is anywhere near done. I think in the next five years, we're gonna see even significantly better materials come out. All of this stuff is actually comes from the sailing industry. So Challenge Sailcloth was the first person to kind of come out with this, you know, um, polyethylene, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene material. And I guess, I don't know if there's a lot of money in the sailing industry, perhaps, but they've really been at the forefront of driving these technological innovations in the fabrics themselves. Now, while I didn't want to make like wild exaggerative claims about the properties of ultra compared to Cordura, 
I want you to think about it like this, because this is a pretty conservative way to think about it. For, for the most purposes, Ultra is about the same strength of a similar weighted Cordura, so a Cordura of a similar denier to that particular Ultra, while remaining about 35% more lightweight. And you'll see really like extremely bold claims. I, 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 try and think of it as it's relatively comparable, but about 35% lighter. Um, and that's a good way to think about this material. Another, another way to think of this that could be helpful is that, so we have X-Pac, Dyneema, Spectra, Ultra 200, Ultra 400, SG, UHM, WPE. All of these are these ultra high molecular weight polyethylene materials. They're all just branded differently. Try and think of Event versus Gore-Tex. Essentially on a technological level, they're the same thing. They're just two branded names and they've gone about things, you know, in marginally different ways. I think that's all I want to say about Ultra for now. It's a really cool topic, but I also think for most people, it doesn't, you don't need to be an expert on your fabric technology to make an educated decision about a backpack. And I'm going to do my best as this review continues to highlight when I think the qualities of Ultra really shine and are being used in a very wise way in these pack designs and where I think, to be honest with you, they could have just used Cordura because I do think that's the case in, in some instances. Up next, I'm going to go over the individual characteristics of the Stone Glacier Terminus. Now, one of the comments I got a lot on previous videos is that people wanted more visual representations of the things that I'm talking about. So as I go through the individual elements, I'm actually gonna point it out on the packs themselves. So here's the marketing copy for the Terminus. Three pounds, 15 ounces, 7,000 cubic inches total, 6,500 main bag, 500 lid. There's only one frame, it's 26 inches in length, it's an internal frame and the bag is sewn to the frame. You cannot use different bags with this frame. There's three belt sizes, um, small, medium, and large. Four carbon composite stays. It's rated for 150 pounds plus. As I mentioned, it uses the SG Ultra PE fabric. It also uses some X-Pack in different areas of the pack. It uses heavy duty YKK zippers. And as I mentioned, X-Pact is used primarily for the frame and suspension components. It has a built-in rifle sling and uses heavy duty one inch Duraflex military approved buckles and webbing. And to give you the high level overview, what Stone Glacier has done is built a minimalist sheet pack. Okay, everything on here is streamlined. Everything on here is purpose driven and they've used as little of everything as they could to the point where I'm actually going to complain about some of the strap lengths as we go on. But you can tell they were so ounce conscious that even the straps, you know, Kurt probably got away with the minimum possible. Um, aesthetically, it's a very nice bag. Uh, fit and function wise, it's a really good bag. But overall, that's the Stone Glacier Terminus. Up next. Let's have a high level look at the Seek Outside Gosshawk. It weighs in at three pounds, 14 ounces. Now the first thing I'm gonna say right out of the gate is that in order to keep these bags as closely related as possible, there is no lid on the Seek Outside. You can add one, but it's optional. It's not optional with the Terminus. But I am using a Talon on the front, which gets it to the same kind of weight category and it adds an additional 800 cubic inches. So you have a total of 7,100 cubic inches in this bag. Now, this is rated at a 200 pound plus load rating. You have an adjustable frame height. You can do 24, 26, or 28. And you have to, when you're buying the bag, you basically choose these little extensions. The bag is 24 by default, and you can buy a two inch extension and a four inch extension that we'll go over later how to install. It's pretty easy and quick, and adds two inches to the frame height with each extension. There is a meat shelf on this bag. There is no meat shelf with the Terminus. The Terminus does have an internal load cell that we'll get into later. This is made out of Ultra PE 400 and Spectra. So again, the Stone Glacier bag is made out of SG Ultra and X-Pack. 
This is made out of Ultra 400 and Spectra. More brand name differences than anything. I couldn't find any technical details that would support one of these bags has a notably higher quality fabric in, in either situation. So they're essentially the same. Now this has aluminum for it to stays. Um, three belt sizes. I will note later in the fitting section, I find the seek outside runs a little small. It's the same thing I find with XO. I'm like a 37 inch waist. Like I normally buy 38 inch pants because I've got thighs because I lift weights. And if I run a 36, they fit my waist, but it doesn't fit my thighs. And if I run a large belt on this, it's too small for me. And it says it's rated up to 38, I believe, but it it's not. I had to exchange it. Um, most people are going to want to size up a little bit. And I think it actually has to do with the width of the waist, not just the diameter, but that's a topic for another day. Um, uses number eight zippers. So that's a bit of an interesting number 10 on this, on the, on the stone glacier, number eight on the seek outside. They both have a form of aqua guard on all the zippers. So aqua guard is that rubberized coating you see on zippers. They, they use, utilize different forms of it, but they both have it. One really interesting thing is these don't use traditional like buckles, like the Duraflex buckles, the clat, like the clicking together male and female one. These use gatekeepers, which I'm going to get into in detail later on. So as an overview, the primary difference here is that I would argue while Stone Glacier has gone minimalist, Seek Outside has gone maximalist in a way, in that the Seek is almost infinitely configurable which can be a positive, but it can also be a negative. There is, I will tell you right now, if you don't want to spend a significant amount of time getting to know your pack before you go on a hunt, like if you're buy a pack, it shows up, you stuff it full of gear and walk out the door kind of guy, the seek is likely not for you. I've already, I've already spent hours with this pack, you know, fitting it, configuring it, trying different compression systems. And I still feel a little undereducated as far as the potential capabilities of this pack go. And I still don't know exactly, you know, I've even taken this thing on hunts and I still don't know exactly how I would want to run it long term. Now that's kind of cool because it lets you really like have fun and learn and do a bunch of different shit, but it's also recognized you got to invest a significant amount of time to really get to know this pack to make sure you're getting the most out of it. So think of it like minimalist versus maximalist or like a, like a Mac versus PC would be another, like I come from the old build your own PC days. And these days, so many PCs kind of come out of the box anyways, but let's, let's go back to like the early 2000s. This is like building your own PC. Like you're, you're picking your CPU, you're, you're picking your motherboard, you're picking your video card. You can configure it in different ways. What Ram do you want to run? All that kind of stuff. This is like a, you know, the, the C, the stone glaciers, like a MacBook, like, it's beautiful, it's pristine, and you open the box. But once you open that box, it is what it is. There's not a whole lot you can do with it. There's a couple neat things like bivy mode, but overall, it's a very streamlined experience with the bag. So keep that in mind. Because I think that's, a, that's one of the questions you should be asking yourself is like, what type of person are you? What type of gear do you like? Do you like gear that you have to spend a lot of time getting to know that has a lot of potential for configurability and customization? Or are you like a busy person and you just want to buy something and use it? Like that's okay too, but ask yourself those questions because that's going to really influence your overall satisfaction with the products that you buy. Up next, let's talk price. So the Terminus wins out here. And again, I've tried to go apples to apples. So what I compared was the base Gosshawk with no lid, just the talon and an added lumbar pad. And that came in at $713. And then I got the Stone Glacier, size large. There's only one price, so it doesn't really matter. That came in at $649. So yes, Stone Glacier is the less expensive of the two bags. Um, so it won. I would say though, if you're going to go base model to base model, it's $53 or $63, sorry, $64. Is $64 really something that I would base my decision upon? No. But here's the thing to keep in mind. If you really like the Seek Pack and you really want to get everything out of it, you're going to end up buying a bunch of accessories and the Seek Pack can get really expensive really fast. Again, 
I'm not saying that's a negative thing. I'll get into the accessories later. There's some really cool stuff and you could build a Ferrari of a pack out of this Seek pack, but it's gonna run you like north of a thousand bucks by the time you get all the little bits and pieces that you really want in order to make it 100% customizable. So Terminus wins the price conversation. Up next, let's look at the weight category. So there's two elements to weight I like to look at and that's weight honesty, was there a discrepancy between the marketed weight of the pack and the weight of the pack as it showed up and weight capacity. And what this is, is cubic inches per ounce. So if the pack holds 7,000 cubic inches and it weighs seven pounds, then the weight capacity per pound is 1,000 cubic inches per pound. And I find comparing those two factors against each other reveals a little bit more about the nature of the bag itself. So at first I thought the Seek bag was heavily misweighed because it advertised at three pounds, 14 ounces. And when I weighed it, it weighed 4.6 pounds. However, um, after spending some time on the phone with Seek, I realized they didn't include a lumbar pad in that weight calculation because the lumbar pad is optional. And here's where we need to have a conversation about the differences or the differences in needs between through hikers and hunters. So a lot of these ultra based packs have been based around through hikers for years. Like you have companies like X-Pack, Hyperlite, there's a bunch more I can't think of off the top of my head. And they have some really cool pack systems but they're meant for guys and girls who are, you know, doing the Pacific Coast Trail with 40 pound packs or the Appalachian Trail with 40 pound packs. No one in their right mind is taking that pack hunting and hoping to carry out a dead animal on their back without using a lumbar pad. So this is where I push back a little bit because if you're gonna market a bag as a hunting bag, just include the lumbar pad. Like the, this is silly. A, it makes the pack look cheaper than it really is. And B, you're, you're trying to market this three pound, 14 ounce pack that, you know, most people also need a lid. That by the time you put a lid and a lumbar pad on this pack, it's over five pounds. The last series I did was on six pound bags. And now you've got like the Stone Glacier 7900, the XO 6400, like the Kafaro, well, the Kafaro is heavier than that. But like you have really feature rich packs that are now only a pound heavier than this. So, so while if you really dig into it, their advertising copy is correct and not misleading, I would say the spirit of it is a little bit off. Like you should, that lumbar pad should be included and it should say 4.6 pounds because no one in their right mind is running a, a hunting bag with a hundred pounds in it without a lumbar pad. So in that case, the Terminus is going to take the edge on weight honesty because um, it, it was advertised at 3.94 pounds or 3 pounds 15 ounces and it showed up at 4.1 pounds. Now that's also probably because I got the large. Most companies use the medium um, for advertised weights. That could be another thing accounting for an ounce or two. The lumbar pad actually weighs eight ounces. It's six or eight ounces on the Seek. So that's what puts it puts it over. So it's a 4% discrepancy on the Terminus. And like at that point, differences in materials between, you know, different deliveries and, you know, different amounts of stitching and all that kind of stuff can compensate, can, can account for a 4% discrepancy. So I don't really hold that against um, Stone Glacier. Also, that's almost exactly what my Sky Guide 7900 was out. So again, I think that's primarily just ordering the large and not the, not the medium. Now, as far as capacity per pound, again, the Terminus holds 7,000 cubic inches and weighs 4.1 pounds. And the Goshawk weighs 4.6 pounds and carries 71 cubic inches. So the Terminus takes a slight edge here with 1,707 cubic inches per pound, and the Seek carries 1,543 cubic inches per pound. Now, 
I do have a section here later on functional volume because these were based on advertising specs and different companies have different ways of establishing the volume of a pack. There's no like one industry standard way that companies are doing this. They, they all have their own little angles on it. Like I said, I will get into the functional volume later, but at the end of the day, the Seek can carry a lot more than the Terminus. Just that's all there is to it. Even not just because of the meat shelf, the bag itself is significantly bigger. I really think Seek have undersold themselves here with the 6,300 cubic inch main bag. It, it, it's just way bigger than that. Um, I, I don't really know where they came up with that number. So while on paper, the Terminus wins this category, as far as functional volume, the Seek Outside is the superior pack. Up next, let's discuss shipping speed and purchase experience. Now, I used to do these two categories independently. I would look at shipping speed and I would look at purchase experience. but And that would be like the online user experience journey and buy flow. But the more I'm coming, the more I do this, the more I'm combining these because um, like what people have in stock, is that really a, a function of shipping speed? I, I would say that shipping speed is a, almost a non-factor and I would say that inventory is, is more important. The Terminus has the edge on shipping speed because you can buy it in Canada. So obviously you're gonna get to me first. But if you were in the States and everything was in stock, the shipping speeds of the Stone Glacier and the Seek Outside are going to be relatively the same. Now, if we get into the purchase experience and we take into account how long it was until I actually got my pack, this is where we see a stark difference. And I've gotten several products from Seek. I think Seek are great. I think they're actively working on this. But a major drawback to Seek is that they are pretty regularly out of stock on a lot of popular options. So it was somewhere between six and eight weeks between when I ordered the Goshawk and when the Goshawk actually showed up at my door. When I ordered a 12-man teepee, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six weeks between when I ordered the teepee and when it showed up at my door. The bottom line is I understand that you have manufacturing issues, but it's not my problem. My problem is that I'm a consumer and when I click buy, I have a certain expectation that within a week or two that product is at my house Seek still hasn't gotten to the place logistically where they can regularly satisfy demand. That's a problem. So in general, they lose the shipping speed purchase experience to the Terminus. Stone Glacier is a very finely tuned machine. Um, now they did run into issues with their tents this year, but their tents are also built by Slingfin. And that wasn't a Stone Glacier inventory manufacturing issue. That was a Slingfin inventory management issue. So, um, Stone Glacier is the superior company in this regard. Now, if we talk about the actual user experience journey or the buy flow, again, this minimalist versus maximalist really shines. The nice thing about the Stone Glacier purchase experience is that you're not left with any questions. They show you everything very nicely. The options are extremely limited. Uh, size is really the only option that you have to pick. Everything's very clear. It's simple. It's clean cut. You hit buy, you're done. You, you feel very satisfied, you're not worried if you made the wrong decision, there's not a lot of buyer's remorse, it's it's great, and then the thing shows up at your house. They knock it out of the park. Now Seek Outside has a different approach. There used to be even more options. They had a second version of the Goshawk that was made out of a wolf material that was closer to the Ultra 200. At the end of the day, the two bags were relatively close in price, but the Ultra 400 bag they felt was significantly better in quality and performance. And because most people were just buying the 400 bag anyways, they've get discontinued the sale of the Wolf altogether. So that did simplify. And that was a change between when I bought the bag and when I finished my review. So I, I felt a lot less confused when I went back in the second time. Because the first time I was like, it didn't really make sense that there was this bag that was like kind of the same price, but they said it wasn't as good. And it was like, well, then why would I buy it? Why is it even here? But that's gone, so that simplified it. However, you're still left with which frame extensions do I buy? How many frame extensions do I buy? Do I buy a lumbar pad? Do I buy a lid? There's also a lot of accessories that aren't on the build a bag section. You know, there's Marlins, which are on there, which I'll show you later. There's Talons, 
but they have these wing pockets that aren't built into it that I think are super cool that should be also. But it's basically like a build a bag of drop down lists. And I would give them like a B plus. I think it's a, it's a good user experience. It's not a great user experience. For instance, I would like an image that updates as I add things. So if I, there's an image of the bag, when I say yes to a lumbar pad, I want that image to change and show me a bag with a lumbar pad. When I put on a lid, I want that image to change and I want you to show me a lid. And I want the weight to update, okay? Because it tells me three pounds and 14 ounces, but then when I buy a bag with a lid and a lumbar pad and it shows up at five pounds, I feel like the company's been disingenuous. I don't think that's their nature, but that's what you feel like because it's like, well, that's not what was advertised. I think the weight should update as you add different options. I think the picture should update as you add different options. And I also think all of the accessories, like if you're gonna be that company that says, listen, there's 15 different accessories you can add to this thing, put them all on that page. Put a little description, tell me what they weigh, tell me what the additional cost is, give me some example use cases, like lean into it. If that's gonna be your ethos, then like embrace it. But again, overall, I'm gonna give the edge to Stone Glacier here, but primarily because of logistics. You just can't compare a bag that shows up in two days to a bag that shows up in two months. That's just, it's just the end of it. So the next two categories are called American Bonus and Canadian Bonus. On my last version of a backpack review, I did a Canadian Bonus because I'm a Canadian and I would say on average, most hunting gear costs about 15 to 20% more here. Either somebody shipped it in first and has had to pay the duty and taxes and then you know transfers that onto you with an escalated retail price or you gotta ship it in yourself. A lot of my stuff I ordered a Blaine because I live in Vancouver and I can just pop over and pick it up. But a lot of people don't have that option and you still might get dinged for taxes on your way back. So I really value when a company says, Canadian customers are important to us, we're gonna have Canadian distribution where you just don't get slammed with additional shipping fees. And Stone Glacier is one of the only companies that does this really well. Mystery Ranch does it as well. As you're well aware, I don't like Mystery Ranch packs. I don't think, I think anything in the last five to 10 years from them is not good and should not be worn, but that's just my two cents. Um, Kuyu kind of does a fake job of this because they, they put you through a Kuyu Canada site, they tell you everything in Canadian dollars, and then they show you the price, and then when they bill your credit card, there's like an extra $150 for shipping, duty, and taxes. And it was like, well, that's not a Canadian option. So, you know, Kafaru does it really well with um, uh, Omer at Precision Optics. Stone Glacier does it really well with Omer at Precision Optics. Having actual inventory in country at a, a, a price that's not been insanely overinflated. So for Canadian bonus, it's got to go to um, Stone Glacier. Now, a lot of people, when I did the Canadian bonus, a lot of Americans chimed in and said, well, what about American made? Because that's a really big deal to us. And here's the thing. Both of these, if you look at the advertising claims of both of these products, they will say made in America. Now, because I know Aaron at Snyder pretty well at Kafaru, and I understand what a, what it takes to be 100% made in America, as far as I'm aware, Kafaru is the only backpack manufacturer to be 100% made in America. That means your thread comes from America. Your, your buckles come from America. They can sell their regular products straight to the military because that's one of the requirements for the military. Neither of these backpacks to my knowledge, are 100% American made. Now, that being said, the manufacturing capabilities, like the assembly components, they both claim to be American made in that regard. I was gonna ask the individual companies, I'd like to give a shout out here to Kurt at Stone Glacier and Lee over at Seek Outside, and a, and a second shout to Phil over at Stone Glacier, because these guys are available for me anytime I have follow-up questions. They never try and influence my opinion. They're always super great to talk to. Now, that being said, I was like, I thought I, I thought I felt it was a little unrealistic for me to say 
So which one of you guys are more American made? Because it's going to be very subjective. If they are not 100% dyed in the wool, American made, like Kafaru, I don't think either of them can make that claim. So I'm going to make it a tie here. And I'm going to tell you that a significant component of these bags were assembled in America, but there are also components on these bags that were not made in America. So if you want a 100% American made bag, neither of these qualify. If you um, want a assembled in America product, both of these fit the bill. Now let's take a little look at lids. So obviously the Terminus <laughs> wins this one because uh, there is no lid on the Goshawk when you configure it in a way that makes it comparable to the Terminus. So here is the Terminus lid. Now it's 500 cubic inches. It folds away. The attachment, one of my problems is most bags don't attach super close here. And when you get an empty bag, it ends up with a bunch of slack and folds over the front of the bag. This goes super tight. I love it. I love that it's form fitted. It's not just this like saggy lump. It's got some contouring to the shelf in here. Um, it's made of the same ultra 400 fabric as the rest of the bag. It's got one aqua guard zipper across the top. As far as lids go, I think it's a fantastic lid. Um, fits really well. It's built really well. Overall, knocked it out of the park. Now, if you were to buy the stone, the seek outside um, lid, this is what it looks like. So this is made out of the Spectra material, not the Ultra material. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Still has the nice AquaGuard zipper, adds another 500 cubic inches, just like the Stone Glacier. If I was gonna provide some feedback, it's a little bit frumpy. It's not contoured nicely like the Stone Glacier is. It's still using the gatekeepers, which I'm gonna get into on a later, later date, which gives it a high level of configurability, but I would argue a lower level of functionality, like they're kind of a pain um, to get on and off sometimes. But also serves really nice as an additional way to distribute compression. So right now, the way the bag is, you just roll the top and cinch it. That's all you can do. If you add the lid, you can then apply a distributed level of compression kind of vertically on the pack. So this is one of those things that I would buy. Like I just, I wouldn't buy a pack without a lid. So it would drive up the price and it would drive up the weight. I believe this comes in at around six ounces. So overall, gotta give the edge to the Terminus on this one as in these configurations, the Terminus has a lid, the seat does not. Next topic, we gotta get into the weeds a little bit. We're gonna talk compression. Now, before we look at either of these bags, the mechanics of how they deal with compression, I want you to imagine a big rectangle for me because most people, when they think about a backpack, they think about a cylinder and they don't really think about the mechanics of compression and how that's going to affect both the contents in the bag and the contents on the bag. So old school compression was one strap all the way around, maybe repeated two or three times. Now the issue with this is that all that does is just crush the whole bag. It doesn't give you a way to articulate the compression favorably to achieve a shape that would optimally distribute the weight along your back. You want weight as close to your back as possible and relatively narrow when you can. And so if you're just crushing the whole bag, it kind of just turns into this lump going up your back and it may spread out to the sides. It may come down the bottom and it may come up the top. So if we think about a, a rectangle and most advanced compression systems these days are following this model. Now that I've looked at a ton of bags, it's making a lot more sense to me why companies are choosing the compression models that they are. So we're going to use the, Stone Glacier bag to demonstrate this. So you will notice there's an attachment here 
with one compression strap here, two attachments here with one compression strap along the front, and then another attachment system here with a third compression. So you essentially have, you can compress the width of the bag with the two side compression straps, and you can compress the, um, I guess, breadth of the bag with the front compression strap. Now, most modern bags kind of repeat that three times. And in my head, I call it three by three compression because you've got your rectangle and you can compress the sides to bring, I guess, the height of the bag down or the depth. Let's, that, that's better terminology. We'll refer to this as the depth of the bag and this as the width of the bag. So you can use the side straps to compress the depth of the bag and the front straps to compress the width of the bag. And it get, lets you perfectly compress anything you want. The additional benefit of this is that you can put things on the front of the bag like your bow, your rifle, and you can minimally compress this front strap. So you get most of your bag compression from the side straps and then so you don't damage your bow or your rifle, you don't have to crank the crap out of these top straps. So that being said, let's look at the actual con compression options. We'll look at the terminus because it's already here. Number one, this I love. This is a, a, a non-negotiable for me, being able to compress the depth of the bottom of the bag. When we get later into day peg mode and uh, training capacity or light loads, you wanna crank this down because you, you want the most of the weight in the middle of the bag. And if you leave this wide open, you get this kind of frumpy, dumpy bum looking, you know, backpack. Okay, so here's the first layer of compression. We can decrease the depth of the bottom of the bag. Second layer of compression. We can decrease the depth of the sides of the bottom of the bag. Now it doesn't have an associated front strap, but I would argue that's not really necessary because we move up the bag four to five inches and we have the first full three by three compression system. We move up the bag another eight inches and we have the second full three by three compression system. We have the addition of the lid compression system that can allow us to just the vertical compression of the bag. And then finally, we have these angular compression straps here that also allow us to run the bag in bivy mode without a lid. I am extremely impressed by the compression system on the Stone Glacier. Other than some of the straps being a little bit short, um, I, I don't have any complaints. I'd also like it if they sent with Velcro strap keepers because I am a guy that when I have everything locked down, I would like to roll up my straps so they're not like flapping in the wind especially if you're doing archery hunting somewhere like windy Alberta and you're, you're on the flats, like you don't want these straps slapping against your bag. So that would be a bit of a criticism, but overall a plus on the compression system of the stone glacier terminus. I, I can't think of anything that I would personally change. It's as perfect, as close to perfect as you're going to get. Now let's take a look at the seek outside goshawk. Now we have to have a conversation about gatekeepers. So here's a, here's a gatekeeper. This is how it works. You compress it, the spring opens, and you slide it out of the tab loop. To put it back in, you slide the metal clip back through the tab loop, fold this down, and compress it while applying some pressure to the spring, and it reattaches. Now, drawbacks to this are super hard to use with gloves, kind of a pain in the ass, even without gloves. As a general rule, I don't really like these. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Now, here's the benefit. You will notice with the previous bag, every time you wanted to have an attachment point for a buckle, there needed to be a female buckle hardwired into the bag, which meant every time you added another potential adjustment point, you added another female buckle adding weight. With these, all you got to do is add this little, you can literally have these tab loops. And if you look at this bag, there's hundreds of these tab loops. They're literally all over the place and they add almost zero weight. So the benefit is you have this 
infinitely customizable compression system because they ship with a ton of extra straps. Um, and you can basically modify it in any way you want. The drawback is the, the buckles are a pain in the ass to deal with. And I really feel like, you know, it's like when I go to like a super nice restaurant, I want to know what the chef's recommendation was. Like Kurt Rassicott is a next, he's like a design genius. I want him to tell me what he thinks the best way to compress this bag is because he designed it. I may, you know, different opinion. I may change my mind later, but show me what you think the best version of it is. The issue with the way that the seek comes is that it only actually came with these two straps attached. It didn't even have this third one for compression. And you will notice that when you use this talon to compress it, which helps distribute the weight, <clears throat> you're going back to this crush everything methodology and you're not able to articulate the compression. I don't have the ability to individually adjust depth and width. I don't have the ability to adjust vertical. There are no compression straps on the bottom. So you might be able to jury rig something, like you've got some tab loops here, but you have no way to shrink down the depth of the bottom of the bag to make sure that the weight stays up and in. So the moment you fill this bag, boom, the bottom just gets thick and blown out. Um, there's some more elements that I'm gonna cover later on in the construction and the fitting components as far as uh, compression is concerned, but overall, I got to give the edge to the Terminus on here. I think the customizability of the Seek is cool, but another element I did not mention is that the straps are significantly thinner. They're one inch straps on the um, Stone Glacier, and I think they're three quarter of an inch straps, the webbing on the Seek outside. They're the same width as the ones on the Kuyu. I don't like it. I like, I like thicker straps. I'll pay the weight penalty for it. I feel more confident in them and they're, they're easier to grab and like kind of crank down. That's the other thing with those gatekeeper buckles, the webbing kept getting twisted. You know how if you're pulling on an angle, it will like fold on you and then there'll be a twist in your webbing that's like a pain in the ass to get out because you got to kind of re-thread it through backwards and like unfold it. That happens pretty often with the gatekeeper buckles. I'm just gonna come right out and say, I don't like the gatekeeper buckle system for a compression system. Um, also, because a, each gatekeeper buckle system has two gatekeepers on it, I'm not even really sure how much of a weight savings there is over the male-female system because at the end of the day, you still gotta have a buckle on each end. And even if you were to use some of the tab loops to try and recreate the depth with model, the three by three model that I've described, you're gonna actually end up doubling up on buckles at all the side attachment points. And I think you can negate any weight benefit. But even just the absence of the bottom compression option on the seek, that's enough right there. I think that's a big miss and that's enough to give me, for me to give the edge to the terminus in compression systems. All right. Let's talk about fitting. So fitting is something that's gonna come up a little bit under construction and a little bit under the, the weighted loads conversation as well. But I also wanted to have a section dedicated to how the packs actually fit, like the mechanics of how they fit to your body because they're significantly different. That's one of the really interesting things about the Seek pack. The vast majority of packs today have the same shoulder strap adjustment. They, they basically use some mechanism to attach the straps to the back of the frame. Most of them have Velcro these days and some of them have a secondary attachment, but you basically just unstrap the Velcro and move the shoulder straps up and down. The Seek is vastly different than that. So first and foremost, the Terminus is an easier to fit pack. Again, this goes to the minimalist versus maximalist conversation. I found it much easier to get the Terminus to just a, a quick comfy fit, literally five minutes. Tried it on once, noticed the discrepancy. 
If you want to learn more about fitting and mechanics of fitting, let me know. I'm not going to cover it here, but you're essentially looking for no shoulder gap. You're looking for a load lifter angle somewhere around the bottom of your ears, and you want the majority of the hip belt weight on your iliac crests. Some people like it a little higher, some people like it a little lower, but generally speaking, you want the midline of the belt to be right on your iliac crest. And so you adjust a variety of features on the packs that I'm gonna go over in order to achieve that. So first, let's look at the Stone Glacier bag. So you can see here that essentially, the straps are just attached via Velcro and you can literally just rip off the Velcro, slide the strap up and reattach it. Very minimal adjusting. You can cant the straps from one side to the other to get it to ride in different places on your across your clavicle. Um, but that's really it. It's, it's, it's quick, it's easy. The belt sizing is very accurate on the Stone Glacier, so a large belt fit me fine with room to spare. Um, I will get into the lumbar pads later. My only knock on the Stone Glacier bags are the shoulder straps are too short. That's all you get, okay? Now that seems like a lot, until you put 120 pounds on this thing and you're trying to lean it on the edge of a table and step into it and these are only coming out this far. And then when you put it on, the strap has sucked so far up into here, you're trying to grab this with your fingertips and you can barely get it. And everything's so tight because you've got 120 pounds in here, it's just a major pain. So I would put another four inches of strap if this was me designing this bag but I'm also on the bigger end of the spectrum of guys that are gonna be wearing this bag. Um, so overall, except for the shortness of the strap, super easy to adjust and fit. Up next, we have the seat bag. Now, the thing with the seat bag is that it's hard to have just a fitting conversation without having a construction conversation, but that's the next category we're gonna get into. So recognize that some of these features I'm gonna be delving into more in a moment. Basically, there are two straps of webbing that run up the length of the bag, and then there's two tri-slides at the back. And by adjusting the length of the webbing up here, and then moving the fabric, the webbing, through the tri-slides, you can move this shoulder harness here up and down. Now, in addition to that, you can put post-lengthening tips in the ends of these sockets here, and that will move the frame up and down. So you basically have two ways to adjust the shoulder strap length, because by extending the frame, that will also change the shoulder strap placement. My recommendation is to find the frame length that works best for you, and then adjust the shoulder straps accordingly. I kind of did it backwards. I found the most comfortable fit with a lightweight at 40 pounds was a 24 inch frame. And then once I got up to 80 pounds, that was no longer sufficient. And so what I had to do was adjust it to 26 inches and then my shoulder strap placing was way out of whack. Um, also, when you're fitting this, you really gotta take a look at where your tri slides are in relation to your load lifters because they, these originally came back too far here and I was having a big trouble um, fitting it. Now. What's important to note here is that I'm just gonna be brutally honest that this shoulder strap adjustment system is extremely finicky. It takes a long time to get it right and it's also kind of difficult to get them perfectly parallel because you're sliding an inch, an inch and a half through at a time and it's like, did you slide equal amounts through? Um, it takes a long time to get this thing dialed in perfectly when I first started doing pack reviews, I used to weight that a lot heavier. The reason is because in my world, when I literally, I've worn 11 hunting packs in the last four months, I'm constantly readjusting shoulder strap length. So I actually gave a lot of favor to packs that were more easily adjustable. I've rethought this in, in recent weeks because I'm starting to thinking like, okay, what do most people do? 
Most people buy one pack and they rock it for a few years. And so maybe it's a bit of a pain in the ass to set up the first time, but once you got it set up, do you really care? Because you're just gonna leave it alone for the next three or four years. So I do wanna share that it's a pain in the ass to set this pack up right, but I also wanna share, I wouldn't let that deter me from buying it. Because again, you're only gonna do it once. Now, if you're somebody who runs a bunch of packs, or you're somebody who you're gonna let your family borrow your packs, and you're gonna be constantly readjusting your packs, I'd have a hard time recommending this because it really is quite a nuisance to adjust those shoulder straps. Um, Kevin is a very renowned designer at Seek and he's a super smart guy and he makes super cool shit. I'm sure there's a rationale for why he did what he did, but like with the gatekeepers, in my own personal opinion, it's just not my type of system. Now, the other thing that I wanna note is that the frame extension posts are pretty quick and easy to put in. You can literally put them in, in in two minutes. Now, EXO had these on the K3, and their argument was you could walk around with a 24-inch frame, and then when you had to pack out 100 pounds worth of elk, which would necessitate a higher load lifter angle, you could pop in a two-inch extension and, and, and haul your meat out at a 26-inch frame. I think for me, I just find the, the, the frame that's gonna work for me at 80 to 90 pounds and just leave it alone. But I did want to say that I really like that feature about the EXO bag and to see a second bag on the market offer that on the fly adjustability, that's really cool to me. So if you're somebody who enjoys different frame lengths and you do like a shorter frame for lighter bags and a longer frame for heavier bags, really strong argument to go with the Seek because there's very few other bags that offer that level of customizability. One note about the Seek bag, as far as the belt sizing, I've already mentioned, in my opinion, they're sized a bit small. Based on their chart, I should have had the large. I had to exchange it for an extra large. So if you're even close to borderline, I would size up. Because even with the extra large, I'm nowhere near touching the ends of the belt. Like I still have tons of room. So I would size up if you're anywhere near the upper range of any of the belt sizes. So one other note I want to make about the Seek Bag is that it has these dual hip belt... Um, webbing attachments. So instead of just having one going into a large buckle, they have two that kind of feed into this smaller buckle. I'll touch on this in construction. Brutally honest, I don't like this. I don't think a one inch buckle is sufficient for a, uh, you know, a heavy bag like this. That's not someplace I'm looking to save weight. Number two, I don't like these separate straps. Again, they've stuck true to their ethos, ultimate um, customization. So you can actually displace more or less of the weight above or below the iliac crest given on your own individual comfort. So it's one of these things that in, in concept, I like it. In execution, I don't. Because when you actually put this thing on your back with 120 pounds and you're trying to grab both these straps at once, because you pinch them and you pull, the fabric doesn't really slide, the webbing doesn't slide very good. So the end, then you end up crunching one and then that doesn't really leave enough slack to get this second one in. I'm not saying it can't be done. Once I wore the pack for a couple weeks, I kind of figured out like how to do it, but I think it's an excess of customization. It's not necessary. I again would prefer the one, the one web or, have these condensed down into one before the shortening or tightening function so that I'm only pulling on one strap. But I don't like the inch or three quarter inch webbing for a hip belt. I think it should be bigger, inch and a half or two inches. And I don't like the small buckle. I'd like to see a bigger buckle. So for all of those reasons, I got to give the edge to the terminus on fitting. I think it's a little bit easier to fit to you. And I think the fit is a little more universal in that you're not changing the fit every time you change the weight or the, or the frame size. All right, let's talk construction. Again, we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk about the Terminus first. Now, the Terminus is a sewn on construction. So it has an internal frame made up of four carbon composite stays that the bag is sewn right onto. 
But other than that, the construction of the bag is fairly standard. You have the same shoulder strap attachment that you have on the rest of their frames. You have the, the same um, belt adjustments that you do on the rest of their frame. And much like I was mentioning earlier, you see the size of this buckle. That to me is the size of a buckle that's appropriate for a hip belt. And see this nice two inch webbing? Like that gives me confidence. And when you reef on that and cinch it down, it's simple, it's clean, it's tight. Now, I would say Stone Glacier is known for using slightly thinner than market standard for, for foam and for, for comfort. If you look like an Exo or a Kafaru or even a Mystery Ranch, they all have thicker belts and thicker shoulder straps. I'm not saying one is better than the other. In fact, at certain weights and certain body types, I do think the thinner is actually more comfortable and I don't think it packs down as much. So the fit six months, 12 months, 18 months in with a Stone Glacier is gonna stay more consistent than some of these other bags where you're, you're concentrating weight, it's gonna pack down over time. Now, one of the things I love about the Terminus is the material that they use on the lumbar pad, which we'll get into the actual lumbar pad later, but it is an element of construction. So I like that a lot. I would like to see a bigger lumbar pad. We already talked a lot about the features. They're using X-Pack for the frame material and the suspension materials. And they're using Stone Glacier Ultra, you know, a slightly proprietary system everywhere else. And again, so in general, they've used very short straps everywhere. I do think they could have added a little bit of length to the straps, but other than that, the general construction of the Terminus is fantastic. So looking at the Goshawk, this is where things tend to get really interesting because it is a vastly different system. This is closer to a mystery ranch than it is to any of the others because basically they have a tubular aluminum U-frame that's wider at the bottom, narrower at the top, that's another thing to note. The width of the goshawk at the bottom um, on the sides of the bag and the bottom of the frame is 15 inches. The width on the terminus is only nine inches. So there is the opportunity for the, the goshawk to become bottom heavy. And that kind of adds to my concerns with the inability to compress the bottom of the bag on the goshawk. So essentially you have this tubular frame and then you have a gigantic like roll top duffel bag strapped to that frame with a variety of attachment points. So it's a much less integral system than the Terminus, but the Terminus has some drawbacks because of that. You can switch bags on here. There's a meat shelf on here, lots more customization. And I do find a lot of the, the things they've done quite ingenious. So there's two aluminum stays that come through the sides here and up here that do give it some rigidity. But one thing to note is that there's very little horizontal, like that's twisting the whole frame right there. And I'm gonna be honest, when this first showed up, I was hyper skeptical. I took it out, I immediately thought of Mystery Ranch and I was like, ugh, this is not my type of frame. Hats off to Kevin. I loaded this thing up with 120 pounds, no discomfort issues in the back, like with the Mystery Ranch. No bending frame issues, like with the Mystery Ranch. So there really is some, some you know, very high quality design going on here. I gotta take my hat off to the whole team over there. At first glance, it's not something I like, but the more I see it in practice, the more enamored I am with it. And when I was originally talking to Lee about this, they really want to appeal to the archery community and having an overly rigid pack frame, when you go to draw back or twist and turn your upper body, it can feel very blocky. So they actually want some of that twisting so that the bag can kind of mold with your body a little bit more. Again, that's something I would keep in mind and ask yourself, are you a hyper rigid frame guy or are you more open to have something that's like a little more dynamic and molds to your body a little bit more? Now, a couple of the issues, this belt is not attached on the top. So the only thing that holds this belt from flopping down like this is the actual shoulder straps. Now in practice, that's fine because you're always wearing the shoulder straps. 
But in reality, when you go to set your pack down, this falls. And then when you go to lift your pack up, you end up dragging this across the ground the other way. And I'm, I just don't understand. Like, why would you just not put a couple Velcro tab loops here and here in order to keep this up and secured to the back of the frame at all times? Um, that's a big miss for me because I got to tell you, as soon as I started putting weight on this thing, there's no ends of frustration with this thing, like flopping down on me all the time. And I was just like, guys, what that was, that was unnecessary. Something else on the back of the frame, the hip belt is actually held in with nuts and bolts. Not a big fan. I really think this has the opportunity to abrade and wear any material that's gonna rub against here. There's a lot of other choices that you could have used besides a nut and a bolt. Um, so I'm a little bit confused on that. Now, the next one is a bit of mixed feedback because I like that the frame extends down past the bottom of the bag because it keeps it from getting that dumpy butt syndrome where you actually feel your bag kind of falling over the edge of the frame and coming into contact with your, your like upper glutes while you hike. The drawback is though, you can't ever set the bag up. See, like the bag always falls over onto its side. So when you go to set it on something to like slip into the shoulder straps, it's really awkward. Like this is gonna be one of those bags you're gonna have to lay down, crawl into and, and roll over and stand up. Or you're gonna have to find something, like there's a good, you know, three inch gap under here. So you're gonna have to find something like a, like a stick or a, you know, a little root wad to like prop up under here so that this isn't constantly falling over on you when you're trying to put it on. Other frame packs, like bigger frame packs, actually have like little bolsters, little support things that come out of here a couple inches so that the pack actually sits on the frame. For the lower weight penalty, I'd actually like to see that explored, even from the corner, so there's a little bit of corner bracing. I think that would be an additionally cool element of the bag. And then, as we mentioned before, there's no lid on this model, so it's just roll top and close. Ultra fabric for the bag, and then Spectra for all the additional um, pieces. So this talon, this um, any, Ultra has this very like rugged texture feel to it. Spectra and Dyneema and Expat kind of have this smooth feel to it. So if it's smooth, it's, it's Spectra. And if it's rough, it's Ultra. And then again, we've already discussed the gatekeepers. That's a pretty fundamental part of the construction of this bag. It provides a ton of customization, but a little bit finicky. I even did some tests, just put on my winter gloves and it was like, kind of unusable like you're not you're not getting these things on and off like practically with gloves on and again we'll get into it more detail later on but the lumbar pad is insufficient in my opinion two things too soft too small and the coating has no grip you want something that when there's pressure applied to it's going to create friction so that it sticks to the small of your back right above the insertion of your upper glutes um, your ventral glutes. And this is the same material here and there's really no give to it. It was funny when I had them on this table, I would go to slide this pack across the table to pick it up, would slide right across. I would try and slide the terminus across and it was literally like glued to the table if there was any weight in the bag. There was so much friction from that rubberized, almost powder coat like, it looks like the same stuff that like Rhino X layer that they spray in the bed of trucks. Um, so yeah, a little inefficient in the lumbar pad in my opinion, but I'm also a big lumbar pad guy. I like them big, I like them rigid, I like them firm, I like them with lots of rubberized material on them. I still think Kafaru has the best lumbar pad in the game. Um, it, it, and I don't, you can't really argue that point. Like if you're into like a really heavy duty lumbar pad, theirs is the best still currently. So over the course of all that, I'm gonna to have to give the edge of construction to the terminus. And again, this is you know, pretty largely attributed to my own personal preferences. If um, there's nothing insufficient with the construction, I don't think they've cut any corners 
or, or, or built anything really poorly on the seek. It's just that the construction choices they made aren't in, in alignment with my own kind of design principles in, in what I like to see in bags. Now let's have a quick discussion about the lumbar pads. I already went over this both in the fitting and the construction sections. The Terminus has the superior lumbar pad. I really think it's an opportunity for improvement on the seek pad, to be honest with you. Um, I would probably go after market. If I, if I was going to use this pad on a regular basis, I would either build something at home and find a way to attach it um, or use one of the lumbar pads from my other packs because I want something beefier with a better surface coating on it. All right, let's talk about load lifter angle. Everybody's gonna have their own preference with load lifter angle. Because I'm a tall guy with a big torso, the majority of packs today kind of have inferior load lifter angle for my particular body type. Um, of the two of these, I originally was giving the edge to the Terminus because I had the Seek set up at a 24 inch frame. Now that worked great for the 40 pound load and for the day pack and the training testing. But as soon as I got north of 80 pounds, the bag just like dropped significantly and it was like almost a horizontal load lifter angle. I put the 26 inch frame adjustment on and got significantly more load lifter angle. So I'm gonna give the edge to the seek outside on load lifter angle. All right, let's talk meat shelf. This one's pretty easy because one of these bags has one and one of these doesn't. So this was a slam dunk for the Seek Outside. No meat shelf on the Stone Glacier. Now the one thing about the Stone Glacier is it does have an internal load cell. I'm going to have a conversation about water resistance later on. But it is marketed as being waterproof on the... Um, on some of the advertising copy that the internal load cell is waterproof. It is not. I've had two separate hunters tell me now they put game bags in there uh, with me and when they got to their destination, the rest of their gear was coated in blood. So if you're thinking it's gonna give you a way to keep blood off of your gear, it's not. You're still gonna have to put it in a garbage bag or something else. And it's also pretty insufficient. It's not very big. Like there's no way you're putting a whole animal even remotely close in there. Like maybe a boned out quarter and a back strap or something like that. Like it's not going to hold, like it's, I don't even know how many cubic inches it is. I think it's toted as being 2200, if I'm not mistaken, which is not, it, I don't even think it's quite that big in reality. Um, so meat shelf goes to the seek outside. Now I do want to have a little conversation about the meat shelf because if I was to place the Seek outside meat shelf in direct comparison with some of the other better meat shelves on the market, like the Sky Guide 7900 or the K3 system, I'd have to say that the Stone Glacier and Exo have a slightly superior meat shelf system than the Seek does. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is the actual support mechanism for the meat shelf in the Seek. And I'm not gonna blow it all open because I could do a whole tutorial on how to access the meat shelf. It's pretty simple to access it. And then you essentially cradle this between the frame and the exterior bag it's not very big, like if you got an elk quarter or something like that, it's, I did, I felt, I was like, well, this is a very little delicate thing. I was like, come on guys, like we're hauling out quarters of elk, like give me a meat shelf, like some fabric. Um, and where they've placed the attachment mechanisms is very interesting. So there's like some halfway up and then there's nothing else until you get to the top of the bag. So you end up going horizontally across the meat. Um, it is still a very viable meat shelf, but again, this is something where I think there's a little room for improvement in my opinion, because it doesn't seem like, like if it doesn't seem like they were thinking like most of the guys who do meat shelves are like bivy elk hunters. That's a big, a big, um, demo of the market. And it's like, this is not, 
big enough for, for what most of those guys would want. And even where the straps are placed, it's, it's, I'm still a little bit confused. And I watched their videos. It was the other thing, I don't want to like call them out or anything, but their load shelf adjustment video, he uses a bottle of water. And it's like, if you're going to shoot a tutorial video, like go get some material that adequately represents what your customers are going to use in the material. Like anybody can put a bottle of water inside a little slip of material. Like go get a quarter of a, of a cow or something and like honk it in there and then show me how you think this should be appropriately at attached to get the best um, kind of support across the entire system. So all that being said, the Seek still definitely wins the meat shelf conversation because there is no meat shelf in the Terminus. And that is definitely a limiting factor. There's some hunts I want to take on this. And because I solo hunt primarily and sell film, I don't think I could really go in for more than four or five days because there's no way I would get all my gear and a full load of meat in 7,000 cubic inches. It just wouldn't happen. I'll get into this later, but this is more definitely more of like an ultra light hunter's dream, which I am not. I'm a lightweight guy. I'm not an ultra lightweight guy. So now let's see which pack suits day pack mode best. So I love buying large expedition grade bags because then I only have to own one bag and I can compress it down for day pack, for day bag mode. So I'm always curious how well different packs are able to do that. The Terminus knocked it out of the park. Because of those lower compression straps, you can basically just shut off the bottom third of the bag. Like just cinch it right to the frame you can put your like puffy jackets, some food and a couple of things in the middle of the bag and then the lid clamps down right tight and you can put like calls and anything that you want immediate access to into that lid. Lid doesn't flop around. You have to add your own strap keeper so the straps don't flop around. But overall within 30 seconds you can convert this thing to day pack mode. The Seek on the other hand is not the case. Again, because they've given no way to compress the bottom of the bag, you could shut off access to the bottom of the bag by just taking one compression strap and cinching it as tight as you possibly could across the bottom. But again, that's gonna put a lot of horizontal stress on those tab loops and you're still gonna have like bunched fabric sticking out of the bottom of the, of the bag. And because it's just one big chamber pocket, like the terminus is a rectangle. So when you compress it, it like folds down neatly. The big kind of duffel chamber pocket that they've used on the Seek, when you try to compress it, it's a little unwieldy. So it, for that reason, the Terminus excels more as a day pack than the Gosshawk does. All right, let's talk accessories. This one is pretty straightforward. The Seek blows the Terminus out of the water with the amount of potential scent accessories you have at your disposal. So let's start with the Terminus first. Now the Terminus comes with a rifle sling. It's the same rifle sling that's available on the rest of their packs. It's great, webbed loop at the bottom, auto locking mechanism up top with a little pop strap that releases the whole thing, carries behind your shoulder. Um, I would watch the video on it. It's a little counterintuitive how to get it set up, but once you've got it set up, super easy to use. So rifle sling is a great addition. In addition to that, you can buy these hip belt pouches and they do have some kind of handy webbing on the inside where you could slide bullets. They've got a nice firm backing to them to help them keep shape, which aids in one-handed zipping, which is always nice for a hip belt because it's difficult to get both hands over there. Decent enough in size. I think they could be a little thicker, like more depth to them and, and hold a little bit more stuff. They're made out of Ultra, which is nice because all of the components on the Seek stuff is made out of Spectra. So just something to keep in mind. But I have two of them, one could go on each side. For the purposes of this review, I kept all the accessories off because I wanted to go apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So there are the Terminus hip belt pouches. Now, first of all, when you order the Seek Pack, you get a gigantic bag full of just stuff. Tons of gatekeepers, some frame extensions, 
Lots of strap keepers, some kind of various assorted buckles, uh, the meat shelf. It just, again, I really do like that they're staying true to their this maximalist approach. Um, and this just shows how customizable they want their gear to be um, by providing you all this extra stuff. So that's accessory number one. Knock that out of the park. Hip belt pouches. Now, these are very flimsy. They don't have any backing. Now, they do attach pretty well to the hip belt, which gives it some rigidity, but you're definitely not going to be able to unzip these, like obviously with one hand, or re-zip them with one hand the way you could with the Terminus. So that's just something to keep in mind. They're made out of Spectra, and I would say they're basically the same size as the Terminus. Here's the lid. We already discussed this earlier. Comes as an, uh, an additional optional accessory. Good enough. I, I wouldn't say it's great. Again, I'd like to see some rigidity to some of these components so that it helps contour and, and keep shape. And save those. Now this thing is super cool. So the way I have that pack configured right now, I have a talon running along the front, which is essentially a cargo panel with a bunch of tab loops on it. So you can distribute compression across the entire face of the bag instead of having these webbing straps with these pinch points throughout the bag. You can replace that talon with a marlin. Now a marlin is relatively the same size, but it comes with backpack straps. So basically you could not only have a final approach pack with you, but add an entire pack worth of volume. Like by the time I get through all these, you could, you could have well over 10,000 cubic inches on that bag. Up till now, the fulcrum has been the biggest bag I've ever had because with the guide lid, the two wing pockets, a couple of extra medium belt pouches, I was north of 9,000 cubic inches. This thing you could easily get north of 10. So this is super cool. It would replace the Talon, doubles as a backpack, doubles as on bag storage, and it still serves the function of distributing compression across the face of the bag. So I think this thing is super cool. Finally, wing pockets. These really remind me of the wing pockets that are on the fulcrum. And so they've got gatekeepers running on one side and these kind of like tri buckles running along the other side. And you can attach these to the back of the peg in a variety of manner. You could have two of them if you, if you wanted. And they're gigantic. I don't, I don't, I don't remember the, that's gotta be 1200 cubic inches for sure if not a little bit more. Um, easily fit a 95 mil spotter in one of those, easily fit a relatively compact. I've actually got my outdoorsman's tall tripod here. This is not even remotely compact and that would fit in there. You might get this end of 95 in there. So, also super cool. So with all that said, it's pretty clear that the Seek Outside Gosshawk blows the Terminus out of the water as far as accessories go. Are you seeing the trend now though? Like this is what is important to Seek Outside and this is what's not important to Stone Glacier. So I almost feel like it's not like I'm uncovering details that weren't available. Like these, this is how they approach design. Like this is what you should expect from these companies. So now we're gonna look at the adaptability for training for both of these bags. And this is essentially a category where I want to rate how easily adaptable you can switch these bags into training mode. Training mode for me means how easily I can put a 45 pound weight plate in the bag, strap it down so there's zero movement, and go do my backpack cardio. And I wanna be able to switch from hunting to backpack training in less than five minutes. So. Terminus wins. The compression system is just far superior in regards to the ease of use. I'm not gonna say that it is absolutely far superior because it's not, it's just different. But if we're just talking about how quickly and easily you could put a 45 pound plate, strap it down and go hiking, 
terminus wins. The seek outside with its inability to cinch the bottom and its inability to kind of adjust depth and width independently, you could get it done. It's just not going to be as easy. All right, let's have a chat about durability. This is a very interesting conversation to have because I think there's a lot of things at play here. And because in an ideal world, I would have tested these each for like a year through variety of hunts and a variety of different weather conditions and like really beat the hell out of them. And then I think I would be able to add some mean worthwhile comments in regards to durability. As for right now, I'm giving this a tie because in my testing, I didn't see either one of these excel. Now there are elements of both bags that kind of raise red flags to me and ultra itself creates or provides some challenges as far as sewing and construction go. So even there, there's, even though I see the possibility for durability and wear issues with both these bags, a couple things on the seek bag that concern me are the small buckle up front, uh, the, the bare bolts on the back of the aluminum frame. Um, and there's some similar issues with the terminus, but in my testing, everything held up really well. In fact, with the terminus, I had a couple people reach out and say they had some abrasion related issues. So, um, that might've been fixed in later iterations. I myself haven't experienced any as of yet. So I'm going to give them a tie for durability and almost be like a all report back as I, as these packs get used more. And as I get more feedback from the people that I engage with, I will update you guys on the durability of both these packs. But Ultra is supposed to be a very durable, highly durable system. Like some of the Dyneema tarps I have are bomb proof. And this is technically the same type of construction. So, so it should be highly durable and highly abrasion resistant. Um, remains to be seen yet though from more further testing. So this is the category that I think may be the one everyone is most excited to talk about and may be the one that provides the most surprising results, water resistance. So before I get too deep into this, I will say both manufacturers do a good job of not coming right out on their website in the copy and saying these bags are waterproof. Seek goes a lot further in their claims about the water resistance of the material. All Stone Glacier says is that the material will not absorb water. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because that, that matters quite a bit for the discussion we're going to have here. But that does not say it's waterproof and it does not say that water can't permeate the fabric. Seek Outside does. It actually gives, I think it's a 1200 uh, millimeter rating for the, for the pressurized water testing that they do. Um, but it also says the seams aren't sealed and you shouldn't think that this bag is waterproof. But if you go to the spirit of the advertising copy and the way most people are talking about these bags, people feel as if these are waterproof bags or heavily water resistant bags. Like you don't need an internal dry bag, etc. cetera. Um, that is not the case. Before I dig in any deeper in this, I'm going to actually include some of the video of me water testing these bags. So I loaded both bags up with stuffing, sleeping bags, cinched them down as tight as I possibly could, set them up in the backyard and put a sprinkler on them for 45 minutes. And I turned the bags 180 degrees halfway through the 45 minutes. One failure is that I didn't set up a rain gauge and I've ordered one off Amazon. So in future water testings, I will be able to tell you how many millimeters of rain it endured during the testing, which I think would really add to the, to the kind of quality of the experiment. That being said, take a look at what happened. All right, I just opened this up. See if it'll pull focus. See all that water in there? See that? 
Look at all that. Okay, so this is pretty surprising. As I opened the top of the bag, water was just pooled right on top of the sleeping bag that I'd stuffed in there, which I thought was like a little bit odd because I'd really cranked down the everything on the top. Like I had cinched it as tight as it could possibly go. There was the last place I expected to see water pooling. And then I thought, okay, maybe it just got in through the top. And then I reached my hand down the front of the bag thinking surely the fabric's gotta be waterproof and my hand was instantly soaking wet. So I'm gonna open up the seek outside and see how it fared. All right, same thing with the seek. Now, the roll top kept a little bit more water from collecting on top of the sleeping bag, but the instant I stuffed my hand down inside, soaking wet, and I could feel pooled water at the bottom of the sleeping bag or the bottom of the seek outside pack. So I'm gonna pull the sleeping bags out and see how much actual water collected in the bottom. Okay, up first, we're gonna do the seek. All right, this is super interesting. Totally not what I expected. So I would have to say, I'm gonna sit down and think about this some more, but just my first reactions are the top of the terminus is not quite as waterproof as the top of the goshawk. And that makes sense because the goshawk has a really aggressive roll top lid with tons of extra material. However, I would say the fabric overall of the terminus is more waterproof than the fabric of the goshawk because the goshawk, literally, like you saw me when I poured it, it was like half a cup of water had collected in the bottom, whereas really in the terminus, it wasn't nearly as much. And I did notice more water came off of the stuffing that I'd put in the goshawk than did off the terminus as well. So it's not like that water got absorbed by the stuffing that was in the terminus. Super interesting results. Okay. I was shocked, as you can see in the video, like I did not expect to pour a cup of water out of the bottom of the seat bag. Like it was only 45 minutes. Like I don't think that would have happened in my Kafaru fulcrum. I almost think in some ways, this, the quasi water resistance of the fabric almost works against it in some ways because the water can get in, but then the water can't get out. Whereas with Cordura, it's just gonna leach all the way through. Um, but I in no way would feel either of these bags are even relatively remotely water resistant. I don't, I think they're almost worse than some of my Cordura bags, to be honest with you. Now what Stone Glacier says that I think is an important fact is that they won't absorb water. So your pack will stay lighter when it's wet. But let me tell you an interesting thing I stumbled upon. It took a lot longer to dry out the internal section of the bag. So if I got a Cordura bag wet, I can hang it up and I can put a fan on it. And in like a couple hours, it's dry because it's a permeable fabric. Air and moisture go back and forth between Cordura. So as I blow the fan on the front of the bag, it forces the water to evaporate out of the, the fabric itself. Because the Ultra won't absorb water, as I was blowing the fan, nothing was uh, evaporating. I left fan on them for 24 hours and I could still reach my hand inside the bag and it was wet. So that's very interesting. It's almost like, like I mentioned before, water has a harder time evacuating out of these bags, which I think, you know, it's really having me second guess an element of, of ultra. And it's like, it's not like it was just the seams. There's no way like for, for where the water was on the inside of the bag, water was getting directly through the fabric. Like when I reached my hand down the front of both bags, both sides of my hand got instantly wet and there's no seams. The seams are on the side of the bag. So there's no way water got in and traveled horizontally across the entirety of the front of the sleeping bag. And like all of the front 
of the bag was wet. So I'm actually giving them both a two on water resistance because they both failed. So do not think that these bags are water resistant. I think the manufacturers should be doing a better job of adjusting the nature of their claims or how strongly, because that was 45 minutes with a sprinkler, man. And I poured a cup of water out of the bottom of this one and there was a half an inch of water sitting on the top of the sleeping bag with this one. Like that is not even remotely close to what I've endured even just this season between sheep hunting and, and elk hunting. It was a very light, you know, batch of rain compared to what I actually endured. Let's discuss functional volume. So functional volume is my characteristic that I'm using to describe the amount of real volume inside the bags. Like if both bags are described or measured as being 7,000 cubic inches, it, it, that may be the case, but is there a difference functionally or practically in how that space is displaced and how much real stuff you can fit in the bags? Now, normally this is kind of difficult to test because they'll be close and what you would need to do is basically lay out a week's long worth of, of hunting supplies, pack up a bag, see how it fits, use the exact same gear in the next bag, see how it fits. The discrepancy is so wide here that you don't even really need to use anything to measure it. Like your eyeballs suffice. The Seek blows the stone glacier out of the water. I'm not even really sure how they came up with 6,300 cubic inches. Let me show you something. There is a full synthetic sleeping bag on the inside. It is about as full as you could get the stone glacier. Now watch this. You still have almost two feet of usable space. Like it's wild how much more space is in the seek. So I don't know. I just think they're being very conservative and good on them for doing it. But like, it's easy to see. I could literally take both the sleeping bags that are filling up these bags right now, stuff them in the seek and it would handle them. No problem. There's no way I could do that with the terminus. So functional volume seek outside comes out on top. Let's talk hardware. I have not made it a secret this entire time that I'm not a fan of the gatekeepers. I'm not a fan of the smaller webbing. I'm not a fan of the smaller belt buckle. Um, I'm not a fan of the bolts on the aluminum frame. This was a pretty easy category for me to judge. Hardware, I'm giving it to the Terminus. Now let's talk load ratings, comfort, and stability. I'd like to talk about the next six categories all at once because I think it's a, it's discussing the nuances between them is where the real value lies in this conversation. So we have 40 pound comfort, 40 pound stability, 80 pound comfort, 80 pound stability, 120 pound comfort, 120 pound stability. So there are two categories per load rating. One is to describe how the weight fits and how I feel like the wear and tear of the weight is like, after walking for an hour with 120 pounds, am I getting hot spots with one and no hot spots with the other? Are my traps feeling compressed with one and not with the other? Is the belt riding too high with one and not the other? Have I had to adjust the straps multiple times with one and not the other? How comfortable is it walking around with the weight? And the reason that is important is that the more comfortable something is, the longer you're gonna be able to do it. And if we go far enough along the spectrum in the opposite direction, if it becomes so uncomfortable that it creates blisters, hot spots, you know, bruises, it could take you out of the game completely. So that's the comfort side. Now, stability has to do with how stable is that load on your pack? Not as important with 40 pounds, but when we get to 80 and 120 pounds and you're on a sheep hunt and you're in really steep country, if that load has the opportunity, if there's slack in the system and as you turn your body, that load dumps to one side as the slack is taken out of the system, that could pull you back and off a cliff. That's a really big deal. So the stability component discusses more about how locked in that load is to the frame or how well that compression system and the bag frame attachment mechanism is capable of holding that 
load stably to your body while you move through a variety of different positions. So let's look at the overall rankings first because I think that will give some more insight into my actual like responses or it will unearth some more interesting insights. So essentially the seek outside wins comfort and stability at 40 pounds. Keep that in mind. The terminus wins comfort and stability at 80 pounds and at 120 pounds. I will say this, the seek outside is the most comfortable bag I have ever worn at 40 pounds, full stop. I think there's a bunch of reasons for that. I think they're using softer materials for their hip belt and their shoulder straps. And so some materials require a certain load before they compress and start to behave functionally. Like I've been testing some prototype packs and they're using very rigid foam. And when I don't have very much in the pack, it's actually kind of uncomfortable, especially the lumbar pad, because it's like this brick. But then when you put 75 pounds in the pack, it compresses the foam in a way that molds your body that's hyper-functional, but you're paying a price for it because it's uncomfortable at lighter loads. This seek at 40 pounds is a dream. It's beautiful. If I was a through hiker all day, every day, it fit very nice, it was super stable, it was super comfortable, loved it. The Terminus was okay, but it wasn't like notable. It just it felt like a backpack. 40 pounds, all backpacks feel moderately comfortable at 40 pounds. None of them fail. Um, but the Seek shone. Like I was like, this is beautiful. And that's where I think you see some like the roots of the design coming through. They really, you know, have been in the past kind of focused more on that through hiker market. And I think being comfortable at that load range has clearly been a priority because some of the design choices highlight that indisputably. So they knock it out of the park at 40 pounds. Now, as we start to get heavier, some of the design choice choices start to play against them. Like how, how I don't want to use the term flimsy because that's got negative connotations but the lightweight nature of the lumbar pad, you really start to feel difficult to keep the load compressed in the smaller your back and it starts to slide down your back. Whereas with the rubberized coating and the firm material of the stone, stone glacier, I'd still like it to be bigger, really fits in the smaller your back and, and hugs that load close to you. I'm a rigid pack guy. I was really surprised how much I ended up liking the weight distribution of the Terminus over the Gosshawk, but again, Let's look at the mechanisms of compression. The terminus is designed to be narrow and tall, to keep it against your back and up the middle of your back. The stone glacier ramps out to 15 inches at the bottom. So the functional volume is much higher, but it tends to carry the load lower and wider, which is not as ideal once you start getting into those later weight categories. So it's really just a function of the design. Now I still, I want to say the Seek Outside ranks right up there with all the other packs I've tested. So let's say the last pack review, I did the Exo, Kafaru, Stone Glacier, Kuyu, Mystery Ranch, and now I'm adding the Seek Outside and another Stone Glacier. So as we're looking at that, that grouping, I still do believe the Stone Glacier, the Exo, and the Kafaru at that 120 pound rating, the Stone Glacier Sky Guide 7900 to be clear, are, are really still your, your first tier. But I think just below that is your Seek Outside and your, your Terminus. Terminus only because without the meat shelf, you lack the ability to really customize the load displacement and everything just has to go in the, in the bag. So that, it just doesn't, it's just not gonna ride as nice as it does on the Sky Guide once we get into these heavier load ratings. And I think just that bottom heavy nature of the Seek, I gotta take away a point or two compared to something like the 
you know, K3 or the Sky Guide 7900. Now, I will say the Fulcrum suffers from the same problem from Kafaru. But if I was to test a different bag from Kafaru that does allow you to adjust the depth and width of the bottom of the bag, I think I would, I would change my opinion on that. Which is like, so we're kind of all over the map here as load ratings. I want to give a little bit of credit to Trail Kreitzer because I had a podcast with him. I got a lot of respect for that guy. Um, he really stands out for me as far as individuals in the industry that are full of int integrity and knowledge and just humility. Like the dude, yeah, anyways, I don't want to blow smoke up his ass, but I was having a conversation with him about my last review and I kind of hung my hat on 120 pound load ratings saying this was the be all and end all. And he really called me out on it. And he said, is that really the be all and end all? Like, is that the thing? Is that the most important thing to you in a pack? If you look at how much you wear a pack and what it, when you wear the pack and what the load is in the pack most of the time. And I really had to sit back and think because I do think it was a bit of a sensationalist thing to do, like throw 120 pounds in a pack and then really rate them. I also think things start to disperse at the extreme. All packs are great at 40 pounds. Most packs are okay at 80 pounds, not the case at 120. So it was an easier way for me to kind of see where the chips fell. But I really appreciated that from him because You'll notice earlier when I talked about shoulder strap adjustment, that was another thing that for me, I used to weight really heavily. But then when I thought about how most people tend to use the pack, it I realized it wasn't that important or it wasn't as important as I'd made it out to be. So what I'm trying to say here is that even though I give the edge at 120 pounds to Terminus, that's because I'm forcing myself to make a decision, to be objective and assign a ranking because that's my job. But do I think you should use that to sway your purchase decision between these two bags? I don't. Because the Seek Outside is beyond um, capable of loading 120. And I think maybe if you went up to 200, I might even change my mind because this bag actually has the functional ability to put 200 pounds. This one does not. The Terminus does not. So. While I think it's an interesting data point, I don't think it's the sole data point you should hang your hat on when making a purchase decision. So let's let's talk about this. If we go through, listen, the Terminus wins the points game on these 24 domains that I've arbitrarily described. You know, they got a score of 31, the Seek Outside got a score of 41. So they win by a fairly substantial margin. But remember, it was just one point versus two points. So it's like, is it really that substantial? The important thing here is that, yes, if you wanted to aggregate an opinion based on a variety of dimensions, I think overall, you could objectively say that the Terminus is, is a better bag. However, let's talk again about this personal preference. Like, one could argue that the Seek Outside actually has a higher value or it is a better value even though it's a little more expensive because I think you're a little more future-proofed. The Terminus you could grow out of. Like I said already, I can't use the Terminus for a 10-day backpack hunt. Can't. So if you wanted to have, because, of, because I solo film and I self-hunt, it's just not big enough. I know that for a fact. So right away, I would need this pack and another pack. I'm never going to run out of room in the seek outside and if i do i can just go buy more accessories i can buy a wing pocket i can buy a marlin i can put a lid on it you could do an infinite number of adjustments to this to this bag um i think the question here is body type hunting preference and gear philosophy i do think that by nature stone glacier tends to build their stuff for leaner, taller guys. And so at first there was a little bit of interesting wear issues with the bottoms of the shoulder straps kind of digging into my hips. I think I figured that all out. So I do feel comfortable wearing this bag now, but by its nature, Stone Glacier seems to fit taller, leaner guys better. The Seek Outside stuff with its 15 inch bottom and its really wide U-frame, I think would fit a stockier guy better. 
just out of the box. Now, hunting preference, if you were an ultralight guy, I think this terminus is a bit of a dream bag for you. Like there's guys who are going sheep hunting with like 35 pounds in their pack. I'm still astonished that they do it, but they do it. If you're one of those dudes, you're gonna have a hard time not buying this bag because it's gonna do everything for you and it comes in at 4.1 pounds, which is like crazy. If you're more of a lightweight guy like myself, not an ultra lightweight guy, the Seek is gonna be your go-to because it's gonna give you more functional volume and still come in at sub five pounds. Probably even with the lid, you're gonna be right at five pounds, which is a full pound less than any of the other major bags that we discussed a couple of minutes ago. And finally, gear philosophy. Like I think some people like watching my stuff because I nerd out on gear and they wanna nerd out on gear and try and tinker and play. And some people watch my stuff because I nerd out on gear and they want to take advantage of the research I've done so they don't have to do it because they're busy and that's just not the way their mind works. They just want to have confidence that when they buy something, they're buying the right thing and it's going to serve them well. So if you are the ultimate gear nerd and you want to rip things apart and figure out how they work and take it out in one, you know, one version and then iterate and take it out in a different version and test and trial and tinker, the Seek Outside is your bag. If you wanna buy something out of the box, open it, adjust a couple straps, throw it on and go hunting, the Terminus is your bag. Like I said at the beginning of this thing, both of these are super high quality bags. Both of these companies are super great companies. I've had nothing but pleasant experiences. Everybody's been super cool. They're also very confident in their gear. Like they were, they welcomed my feedback and I can be a little bit harsh and I'm trying to work on that because I need to remember like these companies are trying to make good gear. And when I find something that doesn't measure up, it's not that I've caught them per se. It's just that my opinion differs from them, but they were more than comfortable that I was going to rip apart their stuff and, and, and lay it out on the table for everyone to see that they didn't try and, you know, persuade my opinions or anything like that. So I think you're really well suited with either of these bags. Now, one more time before we close this out, mindful-reviews.com. Come and join the community. Help me build something cool. Help me disrupt this bullshit sponsored marketplace ecosystem that YouTube and Instagram has become. You guys are not sheep. You don't deserve to be treated like sheep. Companies should not be able to pay people to wear their gear and then provide a review as if it is a well-balanced, non-biased, objective review. They're not. I want to build something that, that, that breaks that system or fixes that broken system. So that's why I'm, the tagline of it all is gear reviews reimagined because I want to create a different system. So please come and join that community. If you do, I'm going to be raffling these bags off one week after this video goes live. So you have one week to join the community. I didn't want to do it on the first day because I think people are, it's going to take a while for people to find the community and decide to join. And I wanted everybody to have equal access to the raffle. So I'm going to open the community for one week and then I'm going to open the raffle. In addition, the Yeti Roadie Cooler is going to be uh, raffled off, not raffled off, but the prize will be drawn three months after I launch Mindful Reviews. So as always, if you can engage in this content, like, comment, share, subscribe. If you want to go to mindfulhunter.com shop, buy a t-shirt, help support the community. I would really appreciate all of that stuff. If you want to get in touch with me, if you thought I did something terrible or shitty or there's room for improvement or you really liked what I did, or you think I covered something and you just didn't understand why I came to the conclusions I did and you want to provide some more feedback or engage with me, j at mindfulhunter.com, on Instagram, mindful underscore hunter. As always, thanks for tuning in.